Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us together so we can know your mind, discover your will, hear your voice, and so we can be directed and led properly in life. Father, we ask him that you lead us by your word and teach us what we ought to know, even at this very time in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding and help us to get practical lessons that will make life what it ought to be. Thank you, Father, because we know you have answered. We're expecting your spirit to speak very plainly and clearly to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. We're still going through the special series of marriage for singles. And I know that there are a number of people that are excited that we're having such a series. But then again, I told you some few weeks ago that these things that we're studying are not only for the people that are single, but they are for people in general that need to know about how to get married in a proper way. But then, for today, as I bring this subject to you, spiritual guidance, part one, I'll be bringing part two of spiritual guidance next Monday. I want you to understand that even though I'll be talking particularly about marriage, yet you need to understand that I'm talking about spiritual guidance in life in general. Because your life is made up of taking decisions. Decisions about major things and major events in your life. And those decisions go to make up your life what it will be. In fact, where you are now, what you are doing now, where you are living now, the level of your life right now is the sum total and the climax of all the decisions you have taken in your life since you were born. The friends you chose, the books you read, the school you selected, the career that you chose, the place you are working now, and the things surrounding your life, and the things that make your life what it is now, whether in the valley or on the mountain top, whether sorrowful or happy, whether fulfilled or unsatisfactory, whether profitable or unprofitable, the life you live now and the place you are now is the sum total and the final result of all the decisions you have taken since you were born. And many people do not know how to take decisions in life. That is why it is very, very important for you to understand today about spiritual guidance. Not only that, in particular as we talk about marriage, I've been exposed to denominations both Pentecostal and Evangelical and Orthodox. And this is what I found out, that in every major de denomination and church, you find that teaching on marriage is missing. They take it for granted. They do not teach the young people how to decide in life, how to know the will of God, how to find out the plan of God for their lives. You can look into the volume of books, sermons, tapes, cassettes that denominations are produced and you will find conspicuously missing the way to know the will of God and the mind of God. Well, they will just talk in general terms, pray and know the will of God. In five minutes, they leave the subject. And you find that even churches that will talk about salvation, will talk about holiness, will talk about Holy Ghost, will talk about almost every conceivable subject in the Bible. They leave out this important subject of knowing the mind of God, the will of God concerning marriage. Not only that, you can find local churches in this town and also in different places where their members just grow up in the dark. They just select in the dark. They do not know what to say. They do not know what to do. They are led at the mercy of circumstances because their pastors and teachers and preachers never tell them what it means to be able to choose the we according to the will of God and according to the plan of God. As you look at bookstores, Christian bookstores, you'll find books almost on every subject. And as you go into Christian libraries, you find books almost on every subject. 
But this important subject of choosing the right partner, the person that will fit into your life, be profitable in your life, you find that you may not find many books in libraries. In fact, when you think about the authors that have written many books, and have written almost about every aspect of theology, you find that they do not concentrate on helping in this important practical aspect of life. Having to know how to choose a life partner. And I thought that people will just come in their thousands so that they'll discover how to take decisions in life. But here we are today. That as you are here, it's not enough that you are here physically. You must be alert mentally, open spiritually, and open up every faculty in you so that you'll be able to know and understand from the word of God, from the spirit of God, how to determine the will of God and the choice of God and to be led in the proper way in spiritual guidance. Every thoughtful person knows the need of guidance in major decisions in life. The decisions, as I've told you, that you have made in life, they go to determine the directions that you follow in your life. And in fact, I will tell you this, they determine your destiny hereafter. When you hear the message of Christ, you are faced with a decision. Should I? Should I not? When you are told about churches and denominations, you are faced with a decision. Which one do I go? Where do I fellowship? When you learn about marriage and you grow up and your body and your people and the things around you begin to tell you you are now at the age of getting married. Do I choose her? Do I marry him? And the decisions that you make will determine eventually your eternal destiny. That's why it's very, very important. And if you are led to yourself without spiritual guidance, without the voice of God, without the might of God, without the leading of the Spirit, without the voice and the directives from the shepherd, your personal decisions will ruin you completely. But God has promised that he will guide every believer in spiritual guidance concerning important decisions throughout life. Look at Psalm 25 and verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. The word meek appears two times in that verse. And of course, I hope you know, you understand, that the word meek is not referring to the natural man. I told you about the effect and the consequence of the fall on humanity. That effect has made you a sinner by birth, a sinner by practice, a sinner by choice, and without conversion, you cannot be meek and gentle and humble and teachable and godly. It takes the hand of God in your life. It takes the cleansing of the blood in your heart to convert you and change you and transform you and make you the meek. And then it says, the meek, only the meek, will he guide in judgment. That is, in making decisions, in judging between different alternatives, the meek and the humble and the lowly and the teachable and the godly and the converted and those who have been transformed will, I, will he guide in judgment and those that are meek he will teach his way and then we're told in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 Isaiah chapter 30 verse 21 actually I'll be reading to you from verse 19 for the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer thee. And then in verse 20, though, the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers and thine ears shall hear a word behind this saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Here the prophet of God assured the children of Israel, the children of Israel, who in their early history, 
had been led singularly by the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. The Lord did not allow them to wander about in the wilderness without a divine directive, without a divine leadership, and without the thing that will point the way to them, that this is the way they shall walk in age. And at that time, in their early history, they had a teacher, a preacher, a prophet, a lawgiver, a captain, a person that will lead them before them, that will be going before them, a person that knew the might of God, the word of God, the voice of the Lord, and he told them every time. And there was no part of their journey that was led to human thinking, human desire, human suggestion. But the Lord led them in the way, but not too long. They rejected, they rebelled, they turned back, they closed their minds to the leading of the Lord. And because of that, the Lord led them to themselves. When he led them to themselves, eventually they went into suffering and captivity. A lot of enemies oppressed their lives. What shall we say of the Midianites? What shall we say of the Amorites? What shall we say of the Philistines? What shall we say of the various problems that they went through? Even when they were in their own land, the pestilence and the famine and all the, all the activities of the enemy that came upon them right in their very land. But now the prophet came to them and said, The time is coming when the Lord will be gracious unto you. And as a mark of his grace or graciousness unto you, he will settle you back again in Zion and Jerusalem. And one of the great things he will do for you, even though there might be the water of affliction and the bread of adversity, that this he will do for you. He will not take your teacher away from you, but your very eyes will see your teacher again. And it will be like in the days of old, when you were guided, when you were led, and you will hear the word and the voice and the impression of the Spirit within you and behind you, saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. Mistakes in choices in marriage partners are very, very costly. In fact, mistakes in other areas of your life of taking decisions are very costly and destructive. It is necessary to be guided by God in such an important issue that affects your entire life on the face of the earth. There are people that do not think that they need the leadership or the leading of the Spirit of God in taking major decisions. But those people do not understand that this world is full of evil and that we are surrounded by the agents and messengers and spirits of evil and that we actually need the leading, the guiding hand of God so that we can be guided aright. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In your own limited understanding, there are many things that will look nice to you, proper to you, right to you, and will look profitable and correct in your sight. Because you do not know the future. You do not know tomorrow. You do not know what is behind the physical. You cannot see behind the wall. All you can see is what is very, very close to you. And there is a way, there is a plan that seems right and proper and profitable unto you. But the end or the final consequence of that choice will be destruction and death. We're told in... Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directed his steps. A man's heart deviseth his way. Now you know the heart of man is deceitful, is darkened, is confused. We live in a confused world. We live in a darkened world. We live in a deceptive world and because of the environment in which we live, spiritual environment, physical environment, social environment, all those things oppress our minds, our hearts and confuse us and therefore the devices of your own heart will not be able to stand except the Lord himself will guide and direct you. I'm reading in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I'm reading from verses, to verses 6 and 7. 
as I read about this, I want you to understand. You might think, when I read to you, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. You might put your own adjective there. You might say, the unconverted man. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. You might put your adjective there. You might say, the man that is not born again. But I want you to understand that even after you have been born again, it is possible for you to still be led astray. It is possible for you to still make a great, costly, destructive mistake in the choice of career, the choice of a friend, the choice of a marriage partner, the choice of the books you read, the choice of the church you attend, the choice of any important thing in your life. And I want you to look at Samuel, for Samuel chapter 16. As I look at this, think about this. Before Samuel was ever born at all, the mother prayed. One of the greatest, strongest, piercing prayers of the Old Testament. Was the heart all centered up in affection on God. Looking up to God alone with the mind totally, di totally divorced from everything that is secular, everything that is carnal, everything that is earthly. The affection totally set upon God. She knelt down, she bent before the Lord and said, Lord, give me a man child. And if you give me that child, I will consecrate him. Heart, spirit, soul, body, life in its entirety. Totally unto you. My mother did not pray like that before I was born. I guess your mother did not pray like that before you were born. And if Samuel, whose birth was uh, preceded by fervent prayer, piercing prayer, agonizing prayer, heaven sent prayer. If Samuel, who was born after the result of such a prayer, if he made a mistake, where do you stand? Where do I stand? I want to remind you that when Samuel was growing up at a very early age, the mother just gave completely to the house of the Lord, consecrated and committed to the house of the Lord completely. And that little boy began to learn the ways of the Lord. I wasn't like that. I didn't know the Lord when I was that young. I guess you didn't. And if Samuel, who knew the Lord, when she, he was very, very young, if he made a mistake, where do you stand? Where do I stand? I want to remind you that Samuel never studied any other thing. He didn't study mathematics or chemistry or biology or physical sciences he did, natural sciences he did not study any of the arts or history or geography what did he study how to know the lord from the time he was born the mother on the lap will say you belong to god the god of heaven jehovah of israel the only living god that boy never knew any other name the name of Satan, the name of evil spirits, the name of witches or witch doctors, that boy never deviated from very early age. And yet such a boy, when he grew up, eventually, in what I'm going to read to you, he made a mistake. You were not like that. You were not brought up from early age. You studied a lot of irrelevant and useless and profitable subjects at school. I did. And here we are today. If someone made a mistake, where do you stand? Where do I stand? I want to remind you that at a very early age, it was in the night, that God called the name of Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. He rose up because he was just learning to know how to recognize the voice of God. He went to Eli and said, you are calling me. Eli said, go back and go and sleep. I wasn't calling you. He had that name again. Samuel, Samuel. God knew his name. The angels knew his name. Heaven recognized the presence of that boy Samuel in the temple. It didn't happen to me like that. I never had my name called by God, called by an angel. And if Samuel that had the very audible voice of Almighty God, if he made a mistake, where do you stand? Why do you think you can make a choice of marriage partner without prayer, without leading, without the Spirit of God? without the voice of the shepherd calling unto you that is the way walk ye in it i want to remind you that samuel had been used mightily of god to choose a king for the nation of israel the greatest nation the closest nation to almighty god he had been used mightily of god to choose a captain are you not of the tribe of benjamin upon whom all the attention and affection of israel is centered and he chose that man he came on to this to the israelites and said see the one that god has chosen for you if he got involved in national choice of a king for the whole nation and later he made a mistake 
where do you stand? I want to remind you that we're reading about a person that had been a prophet. A person that had known the Lord. A person that knew the ways of the Lord. And yet we're reading of the possibility of such a person making, it, making a mistake. And you don't pray before you get married. You don't pray before you make a choice in marriage. You don't pray before you lay your hand upon that brother, upon that sister, and you say, that is the one I want to get married. You are lost. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 6. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me, before him. Look at his, the certainty of his word. The assurance that he had. The confidence that he had. The authority in his voice. He said, surely. And it was a mistake. What do you think about yourself? Many choices that you have tried to make. And you have said, surely, that's the person I'm going to marry. Surely, that's the person that is going to have my hand in marriage. Surely, that's the home where I'm going to settle. Samuel made a mistake. When I read of these great men, stalwart men, the men that had known the Lord from, would we say from the womb of the mother? If that were possible, the person that had known the Lord right from early age. When I read of such people making mistakes, I tremble and go before the Lord and say, Lord, rescue me. If I'm left alone by myself, I'll make a terrible mistake and a terrible fall. The same thing for you. That's why we're here. To study about spiritual guidance. To know that it is very, very important that we will be led by the Lord. Look at verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. I'm sorry to tell you, there are many people who have married the people that God has refused. They didn't hear God. Immediately they saw the car they were using, the houses they were living in, the furnishings in their houses, and their personalities. Oh, they said, surely this is the person I will get married to. Before they could hear the voice of God, before they could receive counseling, before there could be any change, before the Lord will arrest their attention, they already at the marriage altar. And God refused that. And yet, they've gone ahead, they've done it. And now they are suffering. That's why we are here. All these Mondays, that you will not make such a fall, a calamity in your life, that you will listen to the Lord. Samuel listened to the Lord, and the Lord said, I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. That's the secret of it. The Lord looketh on the heart. Do you ever see the heart of man? The desires of man? The intentions of man, the motives of man, the purposes of men, you can never tell. You can never tell. They speak fear, but seven abominations are in their hearts. And it is only God, the God of heaven, that tries the hearts and the reins, that knows all men. That's what the, the apostles said. When they were going to choose somebody to replace Judas Iscariot, they looked up and they said, God, thou knowest the hearts of all men choose and show which of these two that you have chosen and if you do not depend upon that God that knows the heart of all men you make a terrible mistake and a ruin in your life now today I'm going to talk on hindrances and stumbling blocks next Monday I'll be talking on the positive aspect of the will of God knowing the voice of the shepherd understanding how God can walk through providence and circumstances and bring his voice out of that understanding about direct revelation visions and dreams and and the revelations understanding how god will place upon your heart a very definite instruction that you know this is the will of god but before i can do that next monday i need to clear up some matters today concerning hindrances and stumbling blocks what are the things that hinder people from knowing and understanding and seeing and perceiving the will of God and the mind of God in marriage. Here we are. Number one, sight and senses. You know, especially in marriage, there are many people that depend on sight and senses. What they see, what they feel, what they think they understand, what they think they can gather up from all they can see and taste and touch and feel and examine and evaluate. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 6. 
Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass from verse 1. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth. And daughters were born unto them. That the sons of God saw the daughters of men. That they were fair. And, and they took them wives of all that they chose. Mark those two words. They saw. They chose. They saw. They chose. Mark them down. Very, very important. They walked by sight. And I'm sorry to tell you, that is the whole teaching of many, many denominations of marriage. I'm talking of Pentecostal denominations. I'm talking of strong talking, spirit filled, what they call spirit filled in their own sense, in their own way. I'm talking of tongue talking churches. The people that say they are Pentecostal. And you could almost name them, you could almost see them by your streets. That look at all the women don't you see can't you choose two words don't you see there are many look at them and can't you choose after you have seen and that was the thing that brought in the judgment of god upon the generation of that time look at it again verse 2 of genesis 6 and the sons of god who are they we cannot go into the theology today about those sons of God. Wherever they were, they were close to God. Wherever they were, they had the mark that separated them from the world of that time. Wherever they were, they were people that had nature. The nature of God in them. The likeness of God in them. The image of God in them. The similitude of God upon them that made them different from all the other children of men. But today, the people we call the sons of God, they are people that have relationship with God, intimacy with God, the nature of God, the likeness with God. And they saw the women, the daughters of men, that they were fair. And they took them wives of all that they chose. And that is what some books will tell you. See the people and choose whichever you like. Walking by sight and the senses. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men. For that he also is pledged. Yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. I'm looking at Judges now, chapter 14. Judges, chapter 14, from verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw, mark it again, that's the word we're looking for. And saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen, mark it as the word, a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her, you see the word get, choose, bring her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren and among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well, sight and senses. Samson, do you remember that long before he was ever born, the parents had been without child. And they began looking up to God. One day, the mother was in the field, and an angel appeared to the mother of Samson. Can such a person make a mistake? Yes, they can. An angel never appeared to my mother before I was born. I guess an angel never appeared to your mother before you were born. If something made a mistake, think about yourself. And the second time when they were afraid, thinking, what is all this? The angel came back again when daddy and mommy were together and prophesied unto them and spoke about that man that he will be filled with the Spirit of God right from his childhood. An angel never spoke that to my parents, that I'll be filled with the Spirit of God right from early childhood. I guess about you the same. Is such a man, something, that his path was prophesied by an angel. If he made a mistake, where do you stand? And eventually as he was growing up, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. And now, if such a person can make a mistake by seeing, looking, 
how about you you too you can make a mistake that's why we need to be very very careful and very very watchful what do you see light complexioned lady tall short walking missing all laced up and all covered with jewelry with good english that's all you can see you cannot see the wickedness in the heart the deception in the heart the evil in the heart the backsliding in the heart and you cannot see the future of such a choice that you are making they saw they chose you see that is what has destroyed many many people and you know what uh, samson said he said get her for me she pleased me well if you know the story of samson that was the beginning of the ruin of samson i pray for you that you will not ruin yourself because of marriage in jesus name let's go to number two covetousness and carnality another stumbling block the things that hinder people obstruct people and they are not able to choose according to the will of god according to the way of god covetousness and carnality i'm looking at first corinthians chapter 3 from verse 1 and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with meal, cannot with meat. For he that oh, ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and division, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Here the Lord is saying that there are people called believers, they are born again, but it's unfortunate they never grow, they never develop, and they have carnality within them. And the way they make their choices, they make their choices like men. You see at the end of verse 3, it says, Are ye not carnal and walk as men? If you know how some people get married, even those who say they are Christians, they are born again, they are believers. When they were very, very young in the primary school, in the village, the villagers used to say to that man, look at this girl, that's your wife. And then the people also will say to the girl, look at this uh, boy, that's your husband. And whenever your daddy was calling you so-and-so, so-and-so, then the people will be joking and playing and say, well, he is together, he is with his wife. And all that was in your system, in your mind. Eventually, you went to the same primary school. Later in life, you were separated. Now you have been born again. And here you are now in this church, in this city. Uh, but you are still working as men. All that they planted in your heart many, many years ago in the primary school, that is still in your mind. And you are saying, where is this girl, by the way? I wonder, has she got married now? And one day you saw her on a crusade. And looking at her, you say, how are you? Ah, uh -uh. long time no see. Where are you now? Are you married now? No, I'm not married. By the way, do you remember what they used to say when we were very young? Yes, I remember. Remind me. Well, they used to say you're my you are my husband. They used to say I'm your wife. How about it now? I, in fact, I prayed. I've been praying about marriage. I didn't know that we'll meet here just this evening. Look at how God works in mysterious ways. And eventually, and the lady too, who has been thinking that, well, she'll be ex and there'll be nobody to marry her, said, well, I've been looking for you. I thought that you would disappoint me. Now, uh, I believe you are born again. Oh, yes, I'm born again. But uh, what do you mean by being born again? Well, when somebody has received Jesus as a, as a personal savior, that's being born again. In our church, will you attend our church? Oh, yes, since we're husband and wife. And then you bring that person to the marriage committee. Now, as we're going to the marriage committee, don't disappoint me. They will ask you a question. They will ask you, uh, are you born again? You say, yes, surely. They will ask you, how are you born again? Let me teach you, write it down, this is what to tell them. Then you tell her all the steps of being born again. Memorize it, don't forget it. When we get there, they are going to ask you. So you get to the marriage committee. They say, what's your name? You tell them your name. And at that time, all the instruments and all the gadgets of the enemy and all the signs of unbelief, you have, all, you have put them inside your bag. And the marriage committee is not going to open your bag. And then, you know what I mean? Okay, those who don't know, you are not ready for marriage. 
all the jewelry and all the cosmetics and all the painting. They have put it inside the bag. And so the marriage committee would say, well, how were you born again? All that she can not memorize, she pulls everything that the marriage committee would say, you are right. Now, is this your husband? Yes, I knew the will of God. How did you know the will of God? I had revelation, I had vision, I had dream, I had everything that anybody could have. I'm sure that's my, that's my husband. How about you, man? Uh, is she the will of God? And this man will smile and say, My brothers, if I tell you my testimony, a big volume of book will not contain it. How did you know the will of God is so high, is so great, is so deep, is so marvelous? You know, when I knew the will of God, in fact, I, I don't understand. The will of God is too marvelous for me. He has not answered the question. They are saying, how oh, did you know the will of God is using adjective and grammar and English? That's a deceiver. In any case, they say, okay, if you have known the will of God, go ahead. And then they get married and they begin to see trouble. Trouble and calamity. Because they walked as men. Because they did not follow the way of the Lord. There was this idol they had in their hearts. And because of that idol, they were deceived. And they went into that marriage. Look at Ezekiel chapter 14. And from verse 1, Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Shall I be inquired of at all by them? Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idol in his heart, and put at the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh before the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idol in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man. And I will make him a sign and a proverb and i will cut him off from the midst of my people and you shall know that i am the lord and if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a sin i the lord have deceived that prophet and i will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people israel and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity the punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Here the Lord himself was saying that when you come to pray, if you have your covetousness or your idol, if you have the image, the description in your heart already that you have seen, the house the person is living in, the work the person is doing, the car that is using, or the tribe that he has come from, and you have made up your mind, that's the person I want. That's the person I like to marry. That's the person I love. That's the person I cherish. And then you go to pray. God says, He will answer you according to the idol, according to the image, according to the thing that you are having in your heart. That may happen to a woman, that may happen to a man. And if you go to a prophet, that if that prophet is not careful, if that prophet is not a person that washes his hand and washes his heart and cleanses himself in the blood of the Lamb every morning, every day, and is in link with him every time, that prophet will be deceived. And when the suffering and the punishment comes, the punishment will be upon that prophet and will be upon the people themselves. That's why we need to be careful. Covetousness and carnality, number three. Instruction without inspiration. Here is the danger in a church like this, a church of many people, a church of many teachers, a church of many people that profess that they know God, and yet there are many people that do not know God to the level they profess they know God, giving out instruction without inspiration. I'm looking at First Chronicles chapter 17 from verse 1. Now it came to pass... As David sat in his house, 
that David said to Nathan the prophet, Lo, I dwell in an house of cedars, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord remaineth under the curtains. Then Nathan said unto David, Do all that is in thine heart, for God is with thee. I have, to, I have some things to tell you from this passage. Number one, David was a great, great man of God. Do you remember the testimony of God concerning David? I have found a man after my own heart. A man after my own heart. And that man was David. And here David went to the man of God, or saw the man of God, Nathan, and said, Nathan, I'm a king, and yet I must seek counseling. I need advice. I need direction. I need leadership. I'm thinking I should build a temple, mighty temple, to the glory and to the name of the Lord. And Nathan said, do all that is in thine heart. The Lord is with you. Let me ask you a question. Do you seek counseling? Do you ever talk to anybody? Do you have a leader, a teacher, a prophet, a man of God that can direct you and lead you in the way of righteousness, in making choices and taking decisions in your life? There are people, they never seek counseling. But I want to remind you about David. Apart from the testimony that he was a man after God's heart. Do you remember? That David was a man that had sung many songs. Composed many songs. And he will play upon the harp, upon the instrument of music. And the evil spirit will depart from Saul. Maybe you are in the choir. Maybe you know how to sing. Maybe you know how to put notes on the paper and you have been playing and you have been singing and you have been refreshing other people. Does that cancel the possibility of your getting counseled? Not only that, David was a king. The Lord had anointed him and he was the successful king that the Lord himself appreciated. Now maybe you are a worker yourself, a coordinator, a sonar leader, an area leader, a house fellowship leader. Do you seek counseling? I'm talking about David that killed and destroyed Goliath with the sling and the stone. This was a man that destroyed a giant. You have not even killed grasshopper and you don't have counseling. You are so proud. You know everything. Anything you want to do, whether building a temple or marrying a wife or establishing anything, after all now, don't people know who you are? Who is your counselor? who is a prophet of God, the man of God, that leads you authoritatively, that can hear from heaven, hear from God, and tell you, if David sought counseling, how about you? There are some people over there, coordinators, zonal leaders, area leaders, workers in the church, they have forgotten how to seek counseling. Now they can lead their lives like they want, by themselves. They are answerable to nobody. And they are not submissive under any leadership or under any leading. Remember David, but apart from that, Nathan was a prophet of God. But at this time, Nathan did not pray. There are prayerless prophets. At this time, David was, uh, Nathan was not inspired. There are uninspired elders. And there may be some of you there, prayerless prophets. And you are saying, you are calling on the people. You are getting married. Why didn't you come to tell me? They can't come to tell you. Because if you add inspiration and revelation and power and anointing in your life. And you are prayerful. The people of God in the church will know. And if you say you are an elder in the church. But you have no inspiration. You are powerless. You don't have any anointing. And you don't have the mark of God and the spirit of God upon you. And you are beckoning to the young people. Why did you get married and you did not come and seek counseling from me? What to the people that seek counseling from the prayerless prophet, from the uninspired elder, because will be lost, will be misled? Look at Nathan. Nathan that had even had a history of hearing the voice of God, being led by God, and being a great prophet of God. At a moment of not praying, at a moment of not being anointed and inspired, he misled David. What if God did not speak to Nathan anymore to go and change what he had said? David would have been misled to go and do what was not the will of God. That's why we say in this church, the people that are appointed, coordinators, zonal leaders, when the church appoints, that's the people we direct you to. If there is somebody that puts himself as a prophet, any zone, any district, anywhere, but the church doesn't recognize the supposed anointing he has, 
the supposed position he has and he says well i'm an elder in the church what is the eldership why didn't the people of god in the church recognize you and put you there and say that's your responsibility that's your responsibility if you go to those uninspired elders prayerless prophets you ruin your life you ruin the life of the generations after you and nathan without prayer without seeking the face of the lord he told the man go ahead do what is in thine heart because the lord is with you look at verse 3 and it came to pass the same night that the word of god came to nathan saying go and tell david my servant thus says the lord thou shalt not build an house for me to dwell in and so you can see that there are people that have misled their lives because of seeking counseling from people that have not been inspired of the lord and you know many of these people they are not faithful they are so proud that even when they know they have made a mistake they have misled that young man that young woman they're not going to come back like nathan and say i'm sorry i made a mistake i've led you in the wrong way but you see we need to learn because marriage is very very important you know something made me very careful many many years ago i was in this lagos i'm talking about 1962 teaching in moshi Bori street and as i was there i saw a family that family had been married for 20 long years and their children had grown up and were discussing one night i was discussing with that woman she had married long 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 ago you know what she said she told me that all the suffering she was going through in that marriage it was so and so she named that person that led her into that marriage she wasn't sure she wasn't born again i wasn't born again and yet she remembered it was so and so that led me to this marriage and she discovered it was uninspired on call for counseling and advice and after 20 years she could still remember and those of you are matchmakers uninspired elders prayerless prophets the people that say they have gift they have anointing they have authority they have whatever it is and the church has not recognized and put them in any position of authority and you are counseling people and you are directing them and do it this way and do it this way all those counselors who are going to all those uh, coordinators you are going to i know more than them is a lie if he knows more than them how can we put those coordinators over him if he knows more than them if he knows more than them how can we put those zonal leaders over them and he will be telling you don't go to coordinators don't go to zonal leaders what i told you is what to do go ahead and get married when you begin to suffer you'll be surprised that man will not stay with you when you begin to suffer stay with the lord stay with the word of god stay with the revelations that we are getting in the word of god and learn from that story of nathan and david number four dreams and deception now there are people that center everything that they decide on dreams there are people that center everything they decide concerning marriage on dreams but i need to tell you that dreams are common to all men young people dream old people dream unbelievers dream and believers dream jews dream and gentiles dream the educated people dream and the illiterate dream and therefore that means that it's not every dream that is coming from god how many of you had dreams when you're still a non-believer you are not born again at all you didn't know christ and you had dreams can you raise up your hand raise it up very well thank you very much you know there are even people that are muslims and muslims dream now i want to know are there muslims uh, those who are muslim before they were born again can you raise up your hand before you were born again you were muslims before you were born again can you raise up your hand those of you before you were born again while you were still a muslim you dreamt you were having dreams as muslims can you stand up i want to know whether muslims dream you see what i'm telling you everybody dreams thank you god will bless you and there are people that are going about i had a dream i had a dream i have a dream too everybody dreams we need to understand how dream come how dreams come dreams come as a result of the day's activities 
the day's thoughts and desires and intentions and plans and imaginations. Now listen to me. We mix together and interact in the zones. And as we mix together and we are involved with one another, we will of course have dreams about that person. Dreams about that person. That doesn't mean that every dream is coming from the throne of God. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3. For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. A dream cometh through the multitude of business, through all the things that take place during the day. You will have a dream in the night. You have some imaginations, you have some intentions, you have some motives, you have some activities connecting you, involving you with other people that will eventually lead you to having dreams. In Jeremiah chapter 23 Jeremiah 23 from verse 21 I have not sent these prophets yet they ran I have not spoken to them yet they prophesied if there is anything that God hates he hates anybody that will take his name in vain and speak a word out and said God said when that person has not heard from God and so God said, these people that have run, I didn't send them. And yet they prophesied. In verse 25, I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed. I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which seem to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams which they tell every man to his neighbor as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal verse 32 behold I am against them that prophesy false dreams says the Lord and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness yet I sent them not nor commanded them therefore they shall not profit this people at all says the Lord I'll talk much more about dreams next term Monday to know how to be able to know which one is coming from God and which one is not coming from God last line spirits and Satan's agents in first in second Thessalonians chapter 2 from verse 9 even him who's coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The Lord does not expect that any child of God will go to witch doctors, or secure the help of familiar spirits, or go to idol worshippers to know and to find out the will of God concerning marriage. When, when you do that, you come under the judgment of God. In 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Verses 13 and 14. So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord. Even against the word of the Lord which he kept not. And also for asking counsel. Of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it and inquired not of the Lord therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom unto David the son of Jesse and so we need to understand that we should check up from God next week I'll be giving you the steps and the things that help you to know how to discern how to perceive and understand the directives and the will of the Lord in marriage. All these things that the Lord is teaching us, I've told you, it's not only concerning marriage. It, concern, it concerns taking major decisions in life because the decisions you take will make up the totality, the sum total of your life and will determine your destiny at last. I pray that all these messages will not just come in vain to you. They will be profitable as well as practical in your life. Let's rise up and pray. Are you deceived by your sight and your senses? You have covetousness and carnality in you? 
are you trying to choose by having instructions from some elders and some self-appointed prophets who are not inspired of God and not led of the Spirit? Are you depending on dreams that deceive people's hearts? Are you going to false prophets with evil spirits and familiar spirits and enchantment before you can know what to do in marriage? You need to turn to the Lord and repent and talk to the Lord saying, Lord, I will follow your will. I will do what you want me to do. Marriage is important. The will of the Lord is important. Do not be led astray. Do not follow after the flesh. This is an essential thing in your life. Call upon the name of the Lord. If you have made any mistake in your life, you need to repent. Call upon the Lord, be washed and cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. Marriage is serious. Determining the will of God is essential. Do not just marry in secret, taking a step in the dark. 